Hi, welcome to Edward Box Guitar Tuition. So my classic album inspection today is MSG's Built to Destroy. So this was released sometime in September. I'm not sure the exact date, but I can tell you that it charted in the UK on September the 10th, 1983. So it's around this time. Uh, so it's not a classic album, this. Uh, obviously the first three MSG albums are, and the one like Buddha Khan, fantastic records. Um, but um, things went really wrong on this album, but uh, it's interesting, I think it's better than it was given credit for at the time, in the context of the passage of time. Uh, but basically there's two mixes of it, there's the UK version, and then it got remixed to the US with a different track sequence. Um, but we'll look at the UK sequence and we'll talk about the two mixes, but um, uh, I'm saying using the raw we, but I, I kind of like to say we, because I think if people want to comment, they'll have their perception, so... We'll have a kind of conversation online later. But um, yeah, it made number 23 in the UK. So I'm just looking at the notes there. And they went to Ridge Farm Studios uh, and the Townhouse Studios to do these. That's um, I think the ones in Dorking or something. And then obviously Townhouse is in London. Uh, I think uh, they'd spent a lot of money on the previous album. So I'm guessing staying in the UK would have been cheaper. And they produced themselves which ended up being a mistake. A guy called Lewis Austin uh, engineered this, so he's quite well known. He does stuff for Queen and stuff like that. Um, but I think there's too many cooks. Um, uh, was one of the problems. Uh, and uh, yeah, at this point, um, allegedly MSG was £750,000 in debt. In actual fact, on the sleeve notes to the album, it says it was more like half a million. But I did a little inflation calculator thing, and that's nearly £2 million in today's money. So to kind of put that in context, you know, by the time at the end of the first MSG cycle, you know, with the Rock Will Never Die album, the live one, I mean, uh, how many albums would MSG have sold? A million? You know, uh, three, what's that, four studio albums and a couple of lives, you know, they were popular in the UK and parts of Europe, but not in the US, which are popular in Japan. Maybe they sold more than that, but, um, you know, in terms of today's royalty rates, uh, you know, where an artist might get a pound or a pound, 20 an album or something, you know, uh, that would only go so far as to recoup about 60% of that to the record label. Uh, record label would be probably clearing in today's money between three and four pounds a sale, uh, physical, I'm talking about obviously streaming now. Um, so that would put the record company in profit by about a million quid, but with MSG on a downward sp si spiral, uh, they probably decided to cut their losses. Um, how do bands rack up that kind of debt? It's basically recording costs. The second MSG album cost 250 grand, um, which um, allegedly, uh, again, that's like a you know a million pounds in a day's money or certainly 800 grand. Uh, there's things like tour, tour support and paying the wages of the band members like Cozy Powell won't be cheap. Definitely not. I mean, you know, you're going to play premium rack for Cozy. Um, and then the other band members would, you know, d demand a good wage. And then on this album, Gary Barden basically come back and save the day at the Reading Festival. He basically, when they phoned him, uh, you, we need, can you come in and save our bacon? And he basically named his price. So, you know, it wasn't going to last um, long for Michael financially wise. Um, so what's this album like? So the um, the opening tracks, Rock My Nights Away, uh, which I think is a really catchy tune. Um, so... The British mix, I think you notice that the keyboards are a bit tinny, and I think that's the problem with this album. It's uh, it's either two things: it's kind of tinselly and lacking balls, particularly on the guitars, and then the the, the kind of where they choose to put effects on is is they get that wrong. Um, one of the reasons it got remixed is that Gary Barnes' vocals were seen as too dry. Now, listening to the two mixes, I actually like. The dry vocals in a way, but I don't mind the more reverb ones in the Jack Douglas mix. I think what you notice on this album is Gary Barn actually gives a really good performance. I think uh, I think his vocals are stronger on this. I think you know Graham Bonnet's probably you know taking back over from that and having to maybe sing some Graham Bonnet stuff. Not that they've done a lot of that. It's probably put a bit of fire up his ass. He brought Derrickson Holmes in as well uh, on this, although he only sings on one track, and that's in the US mix. Derrickson Holmes is a great singer. Uh, so I think Gary Barden like really puts, uh, you know, he's really kind of focused on this. So I like this track, um, but I think you notice like Michael's guitar's just kind of lost in the mix. Uh, it's got no punch. Um, uh, and then it tends to have a washy sort of effect on it. Um, the drums kind of, 
clarity, clarity but the, the symbols are very tinselly. Um, uh, but I like this track. Uh, it's a really good track. The the, the, the US remix um, uh, is kind of better, I think. Um, so track two is I'm gonna make you mine. Uh, I like this track as well. Uh, again, the US mix is maybe a bit sharper. Um, it's good, good kind of riff. Um, with kind of thirds on this. Uh, good vocal by Gary Barden. Um, this is the first track on the album that kind of pumps eighth notes. Dun, 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 dun. And one of the problems with the, albums, with the album is, is a lot of tracks kind of start like that. And when you get the sequencing, uh, particularly on the US edition, uh, it, you know, tracks can start to sound the same. Track three is The Dogs of War. This is, I think this has got a more pedalling sort of apes. There's a really cool Michael doodle 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 kind of lead line on this again. You just want a better mix. It just feels like Michael's sound is kind of just swamped a bit. Um, but um, 4.23, all these tracks are just over four minutes. They're really good. Um, you know, decent tracks, melodic. Now you've got Systems Failing. This is probably the weakest or second weakest track on the album. It's quite catchy. It's just a bit um, poppy, um, kind of more keyboardy. Um, but uh, yeah. Then side one of the original UK mix finished with Captain Nemo. So this is another cool Michael instrumental. Probably better than Ulsa. Um, and kind of more like Into the Arena. It's got a cool breakdown in the middle. Um, still plays this live sometimes. Uh, I can't remember on the US mix whether it doesn't fade out. The British mix, um, it does. I'm just going to check. The, oh, I've got the times on the CD, sorry. Um... Again, I mean, it just benefits from more punch. I think the US mix is probably better on this. Uh, you know, you get a bit more clarity on the drums uh, and the guitars got a bit sharper. But there's, there's that thing with mixing where you just say you can't polish a turd. And I think the problem with this album is, is the sounds haven't gone down at source. So because the sound and sound hasn't been captured originally, you can re-EQ stuff, but you can't get it where you want it. The only way you could do that is by replacing sounds. Now, if you remix this album, you could probably enhance the drum sounds, but you wouldn't be able to replace guitar sounds. You haven't got a dry signal, what's called reamping. So, um, you know, I'm sure the band are great players. So there's nothing to do with how they've played. There's just something's not gone right in the translation, uh, where, you know, the mic into the desk and so on. Um, it's a side two opens with still love that little devil. So this is interesting. The UK version, Gary Barden does all the vocals. Um, on the US version, it, Derek St. Holmes does the verse. And then Gary Barden does the bridge and sort of chorus, I think. Um, this is a good track. It's kind of catchy, sort of a, a kind of poppy metal number. I, I really like it. It's quite, something a bit different for the band. Uh, Scream is 24. It's short and punchy. Um, I think the Derek St. Holmes version is better. Or, or more to point, it just sounds more interesting having the two vocals. Again, this was something that could have been explored later on in the band with a second banana singer, as they say. Um, but obviously it didn't, it didn't get that far because they, the band disbanded after uh, this album. Then probably maybe my fave track on the album next, Red Sky. So this is co-written with a member of Baron Rocco, who are a Spanish um, metal band. Quite interesting at the time, you know, obviously you'll have like a lot of Spanish metal bands now I can't think of any offhand but there will be a lot but Baron Rocco you know at the time in 1982 were the only one that had a major deal and got attention in Kerrang I forget the name of the band member but um you know for a period Baron Rocco were, were sort of getting like I said a bit of attention um uh, but this is a good one again the the US mix is probably a little sharper but um I think this is the track that could, you know, you could sit on any of the other MSG albums. It worked really well on the Salt Attack with Bonnet singing, the kind of lyrics and the type of riff. It's a classic Michael riff. And I think the guitars sound better on this. Um, going back, actually, Dogs of War, kind of the US mix is kind of punchier. You know, that's kind of if the whole album sounded like that, it'd be better. Now you've got Time Waits for No One. This is the, the limpest track off the album. It's got limp keyboards. Uh, it doesn't work in either mixes. Just under four minutes. And then you've got the last track. So it's called Walk the Stage on the UK mix. On the US mix, I think it's Rock Will Never Die, Walk the Stage in brackets. And I think it's sort of known as Rock Will Never Die. There's a video for it, which is quite high-end, actually. So that probably costs them more money. Um, I think this track's good. It's a bit long, 5 minutes 55. Um, but I like it. And it's a good end of album track. Um, 
So the difference with the US, I'm just looking at the CD here, is the track sequencing. It opens with I'm Gonna Make You Mine, which is a good opener, but then it just time waits to know when the system's failing. So on the US, it has the two weakest tracks, two and three, which is really stupid. Then Rock Will Never Die finished the side one there, which is a good track, but it should finish the album. Sorry, just belching. So then the side two opens with Red Sky, Rotten the Nights Away, Captain Nemo, Dogs of War, still that little devil. Um, so the side two's better, but you know, if you bought the album in America, you'd be like, oh, you'd be feeling the drabs to quote David uh, St. Hubbins, uh, you know, into side one, and it wouldn't encourage you to listen to side two. So that that kind of balls things up. So what they should have done with the US mix, or what you need to do is listen to the US mix, but with the track sequencing of the UK mix, or just take Systems Failing and Time Waits for No One Out. I think this album's a 7 out of 10. As soon as listening to it, you know, I was like, it's not it's not the calibre of those earlier MSG albums. But on its on its own merits, um, you know, uh, it's certainly a 6, but I'd probably give it a 7. Um, it, it just, you know, it's a criminal. If you're doing a Michael Schenker album, you've got to capture Michael Schenker's guitar sound. You've got to capture his solos. And because they're, they're not captured well, they don't stand out as much as... Um, Cool neoclassical bit um, in, I think, Captain Nemo. Uh, there is some cool stuff from Michael on this, but um, it just doesn't... Uh, the vibrancy's not there. Um, the drums, the cymbals are too tinsely there. They're a little flaccid, the drums, they're a bit harsh, the toms. And Gary Barnes, the one who comes across most successfully on this, um, I do, like I say, think um, his pitching's better. He's got more power. Maybe having a break when he wasn't touring with MSG when Graham Bonnet was in doing the album, and you know, uh, obviously, Graham Bonnet didn't tour, he just did that one show. Um, it's folklore, isn't it? Um, uh, maybe that's giving his voice a rest, but I do, I do think Gary Barden it really does well here. Andy Nye, the keyboard player, I mean, he's, he's not Paul Raymond, I don't know, he doesn't, it, it's just not as good the sound with him, but he's a good player. Um, at this point, I think that's six members, you know, when St. Holmes came in later on. Um, but, you know, again, Michael, you've got six members of your band, well, five members you're paying, you know, that's costing you more money, isn't it? And I think probably, you probably lost the deal, it was like, it just wasn't financially viable to do MSG. Um, and that's the sad thing, it's the music business and you've got to have like business acumen um, to do that. Um, we actually had good management at this point, Aerosmith management, it was, it was Leber and Krebs. Um, that's why the Jack Douglas connection came in the remix. I mean, Jack Douglas does an okay job. But he's probably not the right guy for it. And yet, ironically, I think Ron Neverson, you know, Ron Neverson did a really good remix job on an album called Night of the Crime by uh, Icon. So he'd fall out with Ron Neverson, but something like a Ron Neverson would have done a better mix. Or Keith Olsen, um, you know, if I want a polished radio mix, you know, he did a good job and slide it in. So something like that, but I'm just there's still that point. I'm not convinced you polish a turd, or maybe they could have got Schenker in to retract some extra guitars or something. I don't know. But it wasn't a big album, didn't sell much any worse, I don't think, than Assault Attack. Um, but um, you know, it was just that downward thing. But having said that, it's like that for a lot of metal acts. Uh, you know, the initial split of 1980, 81 or 82, some acts by 83. You know, it was decreasing sales and then there was going to be a lull and then people would get into hair bands. But anyway, I think that's um, uh, my Rock Will Never Die uh, waffle over. Um, you have to say it's worth checking out. Get the remaster. It's interesting listening to the mixes and there's some great tunes on it. So thanks very much for checking it out. Cheers.